Here. So, uh, thanks for coming out. This is going off the rails on a crazy train. Um, just a brief introduction for who we are. Uh, my name is Tomek. I'm a senior security consultant at NCC Group. Um, I used to be a Rails developer. Um, now I break Rails apps more or less for a living. Uh, this is Jeff. I'm Jeff Sharmack. I'm also with NCC Group. Um, I've done a lot of Rails related work. Uh, did a couple uh, modules of Metasploit for <coughs> Rails related. Uh, work on Brave Man a little bit, uh, various other things. Okay. Um, I don't know if this needs to be adjusted here. So yeah, we're from NCC Group, um, headquartered in the UK. We're both from the Chicago office. Um, do software escrow, testing, domain services. Um, so let's hop into the outline of what we're going to be going over here. So I'll just go over a brief introduction to Rails. Uh, Jeff's going to hop into authentication. Um, I'm going to talk about authorization and then we're going to do a demo um, of a dynamic analysis tool that we wrote um, to make testing authentication and authorization easier. So, um, so when you start off, Rails is an MVC framework. So this is the kind of the output that you'll start seeing for the directory structure when you run the command Rails new sample app. Um, in the main app directory, we're just going to go over the files that we kind of are going to care about for this talk. Um, you got the models directory, so the models are going to be mappings of objects to, data, to database rows and tables. Um, and then you got the views, that's going to be the templates that the client are actually going to see when they go to your website. Um, and the controllers, um, that's the piece that glues uh, the model and the views together and kind of gets everything ready to present to the user. And the configuration directory, you have the routes file. Uh, this is going to be, we're going to go over this a bit later, but this is a mapping of all of the URLs in your application um, and to which controller actions they map to. Uh, the gem file is going to be pretty much a list of libraries um, or external gems that your application uses. Um, so this is going to be interesting to see, you know, are they using like devise or cancan or pundit. Uh, the gem file dot lock is going to give you the specific versions of those gems. Uh, so then you can start looking for things like, you know, if there's a specific uh, version of this gem that's vulnerable, you can look in the gemfile.lock to see kind of what version they're using. So the Rails way. Uh, Rails is kind of nice because it provides a lot of protections for developers by default. Um, so here we, we kind of have the MVC architecture coming out again through these three different um, mechanisms. So active record um, is how the models are set up in Rails. Uh, that's going to give you SQL protection by default. Now, there are ways to get that wrong. So we have a link there for railssqli.org. That's a pretty comprehensive list of how you can still get SQL injection in Rails applications. Uh, so we refer to that pretty frequently. Uh, action view is going to, um, by default, HTML output encode user input. Um, and again, there's ways to do that wrong, but if you just kind of use the, the framework um, as it's intended, then you're going to get XSS protection by default. Um, action controller is going to give you things like CSERF protection by default through things like protect from forgery. Um, so just going to kind of start going into authentication here. All right. So, uh, you know, as Tomek said, um, like Rails gives you a lot of security protections kind of out of the box. Um, but where it kind of goes off the rails is when it comes to authentication authorization. Um, that's something that most, you know, reasonable applications are going to need to have a concept of a user and what their permissions model is and things like that. But there's really not a lot of native support in rails for, for either. Um, so the first point is that authentication and authorization are two distinctly different things, right? So authentication is focused on who is the user, just on identifying them. And then authorization is, uh, you know, what permissions they're allowed. Um, Oftentimes I see that people mix the two together into a single, you know, auth, um, and that can sometimes be a little bit of a, a source of confusion. Um, on the authentication front, all that you really get out of the box with Rails is uh, HTTP, you know, basic auth, digest auth, uh, which you probably don't want to use. Um, on the auth authorization front, there's really nothing native, um, but there are some helper methods and things that we'll talk about that can help. Um, so you're kind of left to to you know come up with your own authentication system um, so you have two options and the first is to, is to write your own authentication system um, there's some pros and cons to that approach um, you know you're kind of reinventing the wheel and doing things that that people have done before 
um, you know, so you're kind of likely to, to fall into some common pitfalls that we're going to talk about. Um, there's also a lot more to authentication than just verifying who the user is. Um, and a lot of times people don't think about some of these other, you know, ancillary features. Um, in Rails, since 3.1, there's a helper method called has secure password uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail, but that can make it make it easy to get kind of a, a simple uh, authentication function built pretty quickly. Your other option is to uh, to take an off the shelf gem that someone's written, you know, open source, uh, you know, and use that. Um, again, pros and cons. Uh, so vulnerabilities in gems tend to be really attractive, uh, you know, to attackers because you know they're common across a lot of different applications. Um, but on the other hand, oh, you know, well, and for that reason, you know, you, you kind of have to uh, make sure that you manage your dependencies and you know and keep updated as as new versions are released and bug fixes and things like that. Um, you're still going to have to do some work to integrate a gem into your own application, and and there's some caveats to that to be cautious of. Um, but on the plus side, uh, the core code in you know popular authentication gems is, is generally pretty well reviewed. You know, there's a lot of a lot of eyes on it. Sort of the the many eyes makes all bugs shallow theory. Um, and then you know, as the community learns new things, vulnerabilities are found, they're fixed, and you know, uh, over time the whole thing gets a little bit better. Uh, you know, as a result of that. Um, so some of the common authentication gems, uh, devise is really the the big one. Um, you know, I, I, it's safe to say that the vast majority of Rails applications are using devise for uh, for authentication. Um, OmniAuth is, uh, you know, an, an OAuth uh, consumer. So if you want to do things like, um, you know, allow users to authenticate with Facebook or Google or something like that, um, OmniAuth is really, you know, the common one there. Um, there's some some hooks in Devise that allow you to uh, call back to OmniAuth so the two can work together. Uh, so you can have Devise for your standard, you know, username, password authentication, and then have it call OmniAuth uh, automatically, you know, if you're doing... Uh, you know, OAuth authentication. Um, Doorkeeper, the third one there, is is a little bit different because that's a, an OAuth provider. Um, so instead of allowing users to authenticate with, um, you know, Facebook or Google, it allows you to become the, the provider, and, and other applications can, uh, you know, can consume that. Um, Auth Logic is, uh, you know, one of the other popular gems. Um, it's not nearly as common, uh, and it's a little bit different in its model. Um, that it kind of blends sessions uh, with authentication rather than implementing it as part of the user model. So it's a little bit unusual, um, and I don't see it quite as often as, uh, you know, devise, uh, but it's it's worth noting. There's obviously, um, you know, any number of other gems, but these are kind of the, the really popular common ones that we see a lot. Um, when it comes to writing your own authentication, there's a lot of, a lot of arguments that people commonly make. Uh, this is a quote from... Uh, from the Rails tutorial uh, book, uh, it's also available freely on the internet. Uh, so it's a really popular, um, you know, introduction to to writing Rails apps, uh, and it's you know it's kind of the bible of of how people code Rails. Uh, but they say a couple of things here about uh, writing an authentication system. Um, authentication requires extensive customization. Modifying a third party product is more work, and off the shelf systems can be black boxes. Um, and these are things that we hear a lot when we talk to clients and they're describing their approach to authentication and why they've chosen to write their own. Um, I don't really, I don't really agree with these arguments for the most part. Um, to say that an off the shelf system is a black box uh, can certainly be true, but that's just as true of Rails itself as it is of, uh, you know, of, of a third party authentication gem. Um, as far as it being more work to write, to integrate a gem than, um, you know, write your own, that, that to me is just flat out false. Um, you know, it is some work to, to integrate a gem with your application, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not nearly as much work as, um, you know, as writing a, a system from scratch and making sure that you get all the little details and nuances right. Um, but when people talk about, uh, you know, writing their own, um, I mentioned has secure password earlier, and that's a really uh, useful helper method. Um, so this is kind of an example of how you'd use it. We've got a, a user model that's uh, got a really simple schema with two strings uh, for name and password digest. And, uh, you know, in that model, you just include has secure password. Um, what that does is it allows you to do things like this. Um, 
you can call, uh, you know, user new to create a new user, uh, pass it a name, password, and password confirmation. Um, you'll notice that the, the, the schema doesn't actually have the password or password confirmation fields. Those are provided by the has secure password helper, um, which transparently then uses bcrypt in the background, um, you know, taking the password, password confirmation, making sure they match, uh, you know, bcrypting and storing a digest securely. Um, so right there, you've got a, a pretty decent, you know, password storage system um, with, you know, one line of code. Um, you know, then you save the, you know, save the user, it returns true, and, and you know, you're all set. Um, as I mentioned, the digests are stored with bcrypt. Uh, it's a, you know, reasonably secure, uh, you know, password storage mechanism. I wrote a really long blog post talking about, uh, you know, kind of my thoughts on, on you know, password storage. Um, so if you're interested in, in more... Uh, you know, there's a link to that. Some of the other things you get with that has secure password, um, you know, you get an authenticate uh, method that you, you know, you pass the password to the, you know, to the user model's authenticate method, and it returns, you know, false if it's wrong. Um, if it's correct, it returns the user model itself. Um, so you've got a really simple um, authentication function. Uh, you can also do things, you know, since you're inheriting the model inherits from Active Record, you get all your Active Record, uh, you know, finders. So you can, uh, you know, do a query on the user class to, you know, find the user by name, um, and then call authenticate. And if the password matches, it's going to return the, you know, the corresponding user object. Um, but there's still a lot more that you need to do. Um, you know, storing credentials and authenticating is really just an authentication function. It's not really an authentication system. Um, so you're definitely going to have to think about things like, you know, session management, uh, password complexity requirements, um, what you're going to do in the case of a, a lost or forgotten password. Um, and that's a really, you know, really big one. Um, depending on the application, you might have to deal with things like API tokens, multi-factor, two-factor, uh, you know, we mentioned OAuth earlier. Um, so this is really just the beginning. Um, so let's talk about session management uh, as being kind of the next thing you need to do. Um, so sessions are basically the idea of uh, exchanging user credentials for a cookie, you know, for a token, um, and then using that token to identify the user in subsequent requests so you're not exchanging credentials on every request. Um, step three there is kind of important, and people forget about this a lot, uh, that you need to invalidate the token at some point, whether it's when the user logs out or, you know, after some period of time when it's just expired. Um, and in Rails, there's a couple of different approaches to where session state is stored. Um, and so we're going to spend some time here talking about that. The current default is uh, encrypted cookie sessions on uh, recent versions of Rails. Um, so we've got a, an example here. We'll kind of walk through the flow. Um, you know, you've got a simple sign-in page. Uh, the user comes and provides their, uh, you know, their user ID. Um, they give their password. Uh, it's sent to the application that looks up the user by their ID, authenticates them using that password, uh, assuming that's correct, the user model is, is returned, um, and there's a session object created on the server side. Um, with encrypted cookie sessions, that session object is then serialized, uh, encrypted, and presented to the user as their, uh, as their cookie. Um, so the important thing here is that the cookie that the user has is literally um, an encrypted serialized object that the server is going to going to use to uh, you know to create that session. Um, <clears throat> the next option then is uh, database backed sessions. Uh, so we've got kind of a similar flow, but in this case, there's you know a database on the server. Um, again, the user is going to provide their password, authenticates by that password, creates a session object uh, that's then stored in the database. Um, there's also then a cookie stored alongside that session object, uh, and then that cookie value is provided, you know, to the user. So that's just a random token that then allows the application to look up that session object in its own database. Um, so on subsequent visits, the user is going to provide that, that random token. Um, you know, the database is going to do a query, retrieve the session from the database. <clears throat> so there's pros and cons of, of each of these approaches. Um, on the uh, you know on the database front, uh, the user cookie is just a random value. Um, as I mentioned, you know on the uh, on the serialized cookies, it's it's an encrypted serialized object. Um, I've italicized here the database column because I feel like that's a win for database sessions. That there's a little bit less um, you know 
attack surface there exposed. Um, moving on, when we talk about like how we're going to revoke the session um, with database sessions, um, you know, you can just delete the session from the database and it's gone. Um, on uh, cookie sessions, it's a little bit more complicated because you know once that that value is given to the user, you really can't uh, can't revoke it. Um, so you have to have things like um, you know a timestamp in it that that can expire um, or some other token included in that session. You know, um, on both cases, you're going to need to be uh, conscious of you know having a maximum lifetime to your sessions. Um, neither one by default is going to do that. So we'll talk about how to configure that in a little bit. <coughs> I mentioned the uh, attack surface. Um, again, I think this is a big win for database sessions. The only way you can really attack that is to steal or enumerate that random token. Um, with the serialized sessions, you've still got that option. Uh, you also have the possibility of you know, cryptographic attacks against, uh, against the, the session object itself. Um, you know, you've got a, a, a higher probability of, of longer infinite lived sessions because because of the revocation issues. Um, if the encryption key is ever exposed, it's fatal. Um, you know, then I can create my own sessions arbitrarily, and the application will honor them. Um, and then there's also uh, some issues surrounding the the serialization, um, and that kind of relates to some of the uh, the Rails deserialization issues from a couple of years ago. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, the overhead here is kind of the big reason that, uh, that people tend to favor uh, encrypted cookie sessions. Um, with database sessions on each request, you've got to do a query to retrieve that object from the database so that you can identify you know, the context of the user session. Um, so there's a lot of overhead involved in that. Um, caching can help. Um, you know, I've heard of people doing things like, uh, like in-memory databases to, you know, to try and reduce the, the overhead. Um, and Active Record in recent versions of Rails has had a lot of caching and performance improvements. Um, so I don't think that the overhead is, is all that bad except on really large applications. Um, but for this reason, um, database sessions are really are no longer included in Rails by default. There's a, a separate gem that you need to include. Um, and I'm a little bit I'm a little bit disappointed by that because uh, you know while there are performance issues on, on large applications, I feel like you know, there's a small percentage of times when that's really a practical concern to developers. Um, and so removing it, you know, from even being an option in the framework seems a little, a little heavy handed. Um, you know, on the, on the encrypted cookie sessions, you've still got some overhead with just, you know, validating the cryptographic signatures, um, you know, decrypting the data and then deserializing it. Um, I haven't really done the, the measurements to, you know, to compare the two directly. Uh, so I'm going to trust the Rails team when they say that, you know, database sessions are, are more overhead. But uh, I kind of question exactly how much. At some point, I'll probably do the math to, to figure that out. <clears throat> okay, so um, we talked about having a couple of different types of sessions. Um, those are going to be configured in your uh, session store initializer file uh, with a line that looks a little bit like this. Um, you'll note there on, on this particular one, we've got the session set as cookie store. Um, and then I bolded the expire after uh, setting. That's not there by default. So if you don't have that there, um, your sessions are going to live forever. So that that's one thing when you're assessing applications you want to look at. And you know, is there a is there a session timeout? Um, obviously, you could do that black box. Just uh, you know, just have a session active and, and wait a while and see if it's still honored. Um, but it's a lot easier to to just look at the source. Um, so session expiry time has to be manually configured. Um, that cookie store setting is where you would where you would change your session storage type if you wanted to use Active Record Store. Um, you do still have to include the gem in the application to to support that. Okay, so with cookie sessions, um, you're then going to also have a setting in uh, Secrets YAML um, that contains your secret key base. That's the encryption key that's used for uh, for encrypting those sessions. Um, so you want to make sure that that's you know. A fairly uh, fairly secure value, and and you know let it remain secret. Um, if instead you have a secret token, uh, you don't get encryption at all. What you end up getting is is just a, a encoded serialized uh, session. Um, so that's kind of interesting because if, if they're storing uh, sensitive data within the session object, um, you can take that cookie, just base sixty four decode it, and uh, you know you've got a serialized object. So you can get a little bit of exposure uh, of sensitive information that way. Um, 
within the uh, session store initializer, um, you also have a setting here that determines what the serialization method is for that for that session. Um, currently, it's uh, it defaults to JSON. This is the case since uh, Rails 4.1. Um, prior to that, it defaulted to Marshall. Um, Marshall load was the vector for the the Rails YAML uh, deserialization volumes of uh, 2013, I think it was. Um, so if it's set to Marshall and I know the encryption key. Um, I can craft a, a you know, malicious uh, session object that when deserialized is going to execute arbitrary code on the server. Um, it's not quite as bad as the original vector because I do have to have that encryption key. But if that ever leaks, uh, not only can I craft session objects, I can also uh, get code execution on the server. Um, this hybrid uh, serializer is kind of a, an upgrade path. Um, so in hybrid mode, the application is going to issue JSON serialized cookies, but it's going to honor either JSON or Marshall serialized cookies. Um, so it's meant to, you know, to allow you to migrate uh, transparently. Um, I've seen a number of applications where people have turned on hybrid mode to, to you know, to facilitate the, uh, the upgrade and just left it. Um, and you still have the vector there for RCE where, um, you know, even though the application's not issuing Marshall serialized cookies, if it honors them, I could still get code exec. Um, it's kind of interesting. You really don't need to have that hybrid mode for very long because if you have a maximum lifetime uh, configured on your sessions, you're only going to need to honor, you know, the legacy Marshall sessions for the duration of your session lifetime because at that point they're all expired and you're never going to see them again. Um, so it's really the sort of thing that you probably only need to have, you know, in, have enabled in production for a couple of hours. Um, but a lot of times people just, you know, don't go back and clean that up. So that's something to watch out for. Um, we talked a little bit, you know, I, I mentioned lost forgotten password recovery is, is kind of difficult. Um, there's a lot of different approaches people, people, you know, use to, to handle this. Um, most of them are, are kind of poor in one way or the other. Um, there's really only one approach that, uh, that I'm fond of. Um, and that's this process. Uh, generate a, a random token, um, and you want to make sure that that's generated with a, a cryptographically secure random number generator, so it's not predictable. Um, send that to, uh, well, store it in the user object along with the timestamp of when it was created. Um, send it to the user out of band from the application. Um, so this is the usual, you know, you get an email with a link that says click here to reset your password. Um, you know, the user's then going to visit the site, present that token. Uh, application's going to look up the user by that token, uh, verify that that token, uh, you know, the timestamp on that token that was stored is within an expiry time. Um, you don't want these things to be valid forever. You know, if I issue a reset token and, you know, then forget about it and never go and reset my token, um, you don't want that sitting in, you know, in my email box and being valid, you know, days or weeks later. Um, and then you change the user's password and delete the token. Um, that's, that's another caveat, um, that people often forget. Um, you know, after the password's been reset, you want to delete that so that someone else can't reset it again using the same token. <clears throat> so let's change gears and talk about devise a little bit. Uh, I mentioned that that's the way that, uh, you know, the vast majority of applications are gonna, are gonna handle authentication. Uh, so we've got an example here of a user model that was generated by Devise when it's installed. Um, and it's really simple. It's got this Devise helper that, uh, you know, includes a number of symbols here that represent different modules that Devise uh, has to, to include various functionality. Um, the names here are pretty, uh, you know, pretty self-explanatory explaining what they do. Um, you know, registerable allows a user to anonymously visit the site and create a new, a new account. Uh, database authenticatable is, you know, kind of self-evident. It's, it's the main uh, authentication mechanism. Um, you know, recoverable allows for a, a password reset flow when uh, when a password's forgotten. Um, there's a number of other modules here that are commented out that just aren't enabled by default. Um, you know, so the, so it's kind of nice that you can just enable and de disable these modules and get different uh, you know different components of functionality. Um, once you've got device installed, if you look at your routes RB, you're going to see a line that's uh, device for users, just that one line. Um, this calls this device helper on your user model. Um, and the effect of that is going to be if you run rake routes and see which are actual, uh, you know, routes that the application has, uh, you know, has configured are, you see this. Um, so you've got a whole number of different routes with, uh, you know, various methods. Um, and these do things like, you know, 
give the user a sign-in page, accept their credentials and authenticate them, uh, you know, present a, a password reset flow. Um, so with, without a lot of work, you, you know, you get a lot of functionality. <laughs> so then tying device to the application, um, you've got a bunch of helpers uh, provided. Um, the main thing is this controller filter. Um, you're usually going to see this uh, implemented as a before action in the application controller that all the other controllers inherit from. Um, and that's a really easy way to just say, okay, across the application, we're going to authenticate users. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that on the, on the authorization side. The other helpers then are, you know, pretty well named user signed in returns a Boolean of whether the user signed in or not. Uh, current user, user session return, you know, the current user in the user session. Um, uh, current user is really the big one, uh, cause you'll see most of your, uh, your, you know, queries are going to be built from that object as the root. Uh, device has a bit of a security history. Uh, this is a snippet of some of the, the recent versions uh, that have had, you know, security relevant changes. Um, the key point here is that most of these are really kind of minor uh, flaws. Um, and they're the sort of things that are really easy to get wrong. But, you know, over time, uh, community is kind of benefiting from, from uh, you know, improvements in device. Uh, the two that are bolded, um, I'm going to talk about over the next couple of slides, um, storing HMAC of, of reset tokens now instead of uh, the raw value of the token itself. Um, and then there was a type confusion vulnerability. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple of slides talking about this. Uh, this is a really interesting vulnerability. It was disclosed in 2013 by Yorn Chen. Um, so let's look at how that works. Um, Roughly devises password reset function is going to look something like this. Um, this is kind of pseudocode. It's split across a number of different, uh, you know, different classes and it's a lot more complicated. Uh, but the basic idea of it is that, you know, when this reset method is called, um, we're going to get the user's reset password token from the parameters, uh, look up the user object associated with that token. Uh, and then, you know, if it exists, we're going to change the password to the new value. Um, with that in mind, the bug actually stems from uh, MySQL's equality uh, operators. Um, so this is really not what I would expect. Um, you know, when you do a, a query where uh, the integer one equals a string that starts with one, uh, it's actually true and it's going to return data. Um, similarly, the integer zero is going to be equivalent to any string that begins with a non-integer character. Um, I don't, I don't get this. I have no idea why this is the case. Um, but that's how MySQL's equality works. And, uh, it doesn't seem like they're likely to change it because it's going to break all kinds of things if they do. Um, but that's really the root of the bug. Um, yeah, right. Like, yeah, I, like, I, it's, it's, it's so like, what? Yeah. Um, but anyway, how do we exploit this in Rails and in Devise? Um, you know, in Rails, there's this, this hash called params um, that's usually uh, a bunch of strings that are the user's uh, URL parameters. Um, so if you've got a query with foo bar or fizz buzz, um, you get a params hash where, you know, foo is, is bar and so on. Um, if you pass integers, as in the second example there, um, it's interesting to note that those are quoted, so they're, they're strings. Um, you know, even though it's an integer value, it's, it's handled as a string in the params hash. Um, we don't need strings here. We need to get integers for that, for that MySQL confusion. Um, there's some Rails magic that lets us do that. Uh, Rails, uh, will, when it receives a, a, a post with a, uh, an XML or JSON body, it's going to automatically parse that body, um, and typecast things as XML or JSON formats, uh, dictate. Uh, XML is no longer supported out of the box in, uh, you know, in 4.0 and later. Um, there's a separate gem to enable it, but that was kind of disabled again as a result of the, the XML, uh, you know, deserialization bones. Uh, JSON, however, is still supported automatically out of the box on, uh, on all versions of Rails. <laughs> so if we send a post, uh, with the XML example like this, uh, you know, with, with an object foo, uh, on fizz, you'll notice we specify the type as an integer. Um, then we're going to get back a params hash where fizz is the integer one. So now we've got integers in the params hash, uh, and that's kind of the first step. 
Um, similarly with JSON, uh, if we send JSON like this and just don't quote the reset password token, um, you know, it's going to come through as an integer. So now we've got the integer zero. Um, so if we send something like this to the application, what we're going to end up with is params hash, uh, you know, where we control password, password confirmation, and reset token is the integer zero. As a result of that, uh, the active record query is going to do a find by token with the integer zero as the argument. Um, active records then going to build a SQL query that, uh, you know, that looks like this, where token equals integer zero. Uh, and the result of that is that we're going to get back the user object of the first uh, outstanding token. Uh, and there's a little bit of a caveat because due to the comparison, this is the first outstanding token that starts with a non-integer. Um, but in most cases, you know, your tokens are generally not going to have integers, or if they do, they're only going to be, you know, one or two digits deep before it, it you know, before it's a, a an alpha character. Um, so that's kind of interesting because now we've got, uh, you know, we've got a user object from a password reset token that we didn't know. Um, so that's the core of the vulnerability. Um, I wrote a Metasploit module for this a couple of years ago. Um, the Metasploit module uh, we'll loop through and, uh, you know, monitor the response codes to clear out any existing tokens. Um, the benefit of doing that is that then we can send a, a, you know, a password recovery request for a given user, um, and know that that's the only token outstanding. There's a little bit of a race condition there if the applications, you know, other people are requesting things at the same time. Uh, but generally it's fast enough that, uh, you know, it's not going to be too much of an issue. <coughs> Once we've got an outstanding token, um, we can go ahead and, uh, and reset the password without knowing that token. Uh, the caveat to this is that the legitimate user of the account is going to get an email. Um, there's nothing we could do about that. You know, they're going to get the, the password reset email with their token. Uh, but I think, you know, by the time they see that, you're generally going to already be in. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, that's kind of fun. <laughs> um, so why are we talking about this, uh, you know, this vulnerability, uh, it's from 2013. It's patched in recent versions of the device. Uh, the device patch, all it really does, uh, and I should go back to that pseudocode. Um, uh, where is it? There we go. So I said that the, uh, the reset method looks something like this. Um, the patch essentially takes that, that find by token and adds a to string. Um, so it just casts it, you know, explicitly to a string. So you can't get integers through. Um, that's how Devise patched it. Uh, Rails also, let's see. Oh, okay. Well, I'll make this point before I move on to that. Um, the core vulnerability here being in MySQL and, you know, due to active records queries affects a lot more than just Devise. Um, so while it's a, while it's a couple of years old vulnerability and, you know, most people have upgraded Devise in the meantime, um, you see that same thing a lot of times when people write their own, uh, you know, their own recovery functions. Um, you know, API tokens, reset tokens, thing like that. Um, so it's, it's a good one to be aware of. That Metasploit module can pretty easily be tweaked to, uh, you know, to interoperate with, with different endpoints, uh, that would be vulnerable to the same, you know, the same issue. Um, I talked about the device patch. The Rails, uh, fixes for this are kind of interesting. Um, in Rails 3212, they pushed a change that would, uh, that would cause Active Record to build its queries using the type of the database schema. Um, so if it's looking up a string in the database, it would cast the parameter to a string automatically. Um, they ended up reverting that in Rails 3213 because it broke some other functionality. Uh, so on the 32 branch, there's really only one version where that, that function is enabled in Rails. Um, 42 and later, however, uh, we'll build queries that way out of the box. Um, so that's an improvement. But even on 4.2 and later, uh, if you build your queries using something like where, uh, you know, you can still introduce the same, the same sort of issue. Um, this is a parameterized query, so it's not SQL injectable. Um, but I can, you know, I can control the type of the parameter and that's, that's really all I need to, you know, to exploit something like this. Um, so with that, we're gonna we're gonna move on to authorization. Tomek's gonna talk about that. All right. Um, so now that we have an, a user that's ultimately authenticated, um, let's go over authorization. So I kind of think about this as what can they do 
Um, and this tends to be tied to the concept of roles within applications. Um, I like to break it down into two separate groups. So you have the notion of vertical authorization. Uh, so in the examples here, you might have a site admin that's full access, an organization admin that's going to have a more granular um, access controls applied to it, you know, maybe full access to a specific organization, um, a regular user who's going to have limited read access, and then unauthenticated who should have no access to anything. Um, horizontal authorization, on the other hand, is a regular user in organization one shouldn't be able to see the data um, of organization two. So what does this look like in authorization? Um, we tend to see that for vertical authorization, that gets implemented with the use of before actions. Um, so here we have some examples. Um, at the top, you might see something in a controller that says require admin. Um, so before actions is pretty much a method that's going to get run before um, any action is called within that controller. Um, and then you can specify options to say things like only or accept um, if you only want the actions, the before actions to be run on certain controller actions. Um, so for horizontal authorization, this tends to get um, implemented with the use of associations. So we had the notion of a current user object in device. Um, and then what you're going to do here is say, OK, for the current user, um, let's get their organization, um, get all the posts within that organization, and then look at, do our lookup methods um, on that. So what that does is it, it pretty much keeps the subset of data that's going to get queried to things that belong to that user. Um, so going into how routing works in Rails, uh, we're just going to briefly go over this. Um, this is going to be a line that you'll see in the configuration file um, in, in routes.rb. And so uh, you pr it's pretty simple here. You have your HTTP method, um, the path that you want to expose in your application, and then you point it to the controller um, and action. And here this is the notion of controller is a class, and an action is a method within that class. Uh, so this is going to be a typical uh, Rails controller. Um, you'll see that it's inheriting from application controller here. Index is going to be, um, you know, the, the method within this class that's going to be exposed. Uh, and so that's the action in Rails. Um, but yeah, so you'll notice the use of the application controller here. So we'll kind of go into that and talk about controller hierarchy. So the application controller is the main um, kind of class that by default, all of the controllers are going to inherit from. Uh, so it's very common that you're going to see kind of site-wide authorization and authentication before actions um, within this. You're also going to get things by default. So that protect from forgery line um, is just generated when you generate the application. Um, so again, going back to the post controller, that's going to inherit from application controller. Um, and then as you go up, um, you have more lighter weight uh, classes, and so you're going to start losing functionality that you get by default. So, for example, we're, we sometimes see applications where you know people um, inherit from ap application or action controller base, and so they're going to lose things like CSERF protection. Um, so, going into how callbacks work within Rails, um, you tend to have three different ways um, that you can apply this. So, you have before, around, and after. But with the way that authorization tends to work, you want to authorize the user um, before you start running any code that might change the database. So we tend to focus on before actions. Um, and you're going to see this in a few different flavors. We kind of touched on this earlier. Um, but you can say only or accept, which is going to be pretty much an array of actions um, to say only run it on these or run it on everything except these actions. Um, you can also provide other conditional methods and say, you know, if this method returns true, run this before action or unless. Um, you can also skip before actions. Uh, so you can say, you know, if you have the application controller and it's calling authorize user, which means that it's going to get run on every single action by default, uh, you can say skip uh, the authorize user before action on specific um, controller actions. Uh, you'll also see things like uh, you can pass it a proc with custom um, authorization logic if it's small enough that it's going to fit there, uh, but this is pretty rare. 
So there are um, some authorization gems um, for Rails. Pundit and CanCanCan, formerly CanCan, um, are two of the more popular ones. Um, so Pundit, you're going to see something like this, where you look up um, a post object, and then you call authorize on that. And so that's going to be an actual method call within the controller action itself. Um, can, can, can uh, works in a very similar way, um, but you kind of specify the actual ability as you call the authorize method. And it provides some helper methods as well, uh, like load and authorize resource, which is smart enough to know that, hey, um, you're, you're probably looking for a post object, so I'm going to load that by the um, ID param and look that up and authorize the user. Um, just a quick note on that, um, although Pundit and CanCanCan can, can are uh, pretty popular, I think we tend to see more often than not that people implement their own authorization logic. Um, so we're kind of go over things to be on the lookout for. Um, calling find by methods directly on models. Uh, so we kind of talked about associations earlier. Uh, this is just something to be on the lookout for. It's not automatically going to be a vulnerability, but when we find authorization flaws, it's going to be around patterns like this. Um, so we like to see, again, the use of associations, limit the subset of data um, that you're querying to ones that belong to the user. Um, so be on the lookout for whitelisted actions. Um, so here we're saying authorize author for only the update, destroy, and create actions in the post controller. Um, so you might think about the scenario where developer comes in, adds a new controller action, um, and they don't add that new controller action to this list. Um, so that's what you might find an authorization bypass around that. Um, so we tend to like um, more kind of like a blacklist approach where you're saying um, run this authorized author before action on every single um, action of the post controller automatically except for the ones provided. So in that same scenario, if the developer comes in, adds a new controller action, they have to ex explicitly add it to this list so that it doesn't get run. Um, lightweight controllers, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the farther you go up that hierarchy, the more you're going to lose here. Um, again, inheriting directly from action controller base, uh, you're going to lose things like CSERF. Now, that doesn't... Um, mean that's going to be a vulnerability necessarily because you might want this for things like APIs, right? Um, but when you get down to like action controller metal, you just lose the ability to even call before actions because that's a middleware. Uh, so you would have to include that explicitly. Um, so yeah, if you see a controller that just inherits from application controller, um, you're probably not going to see anything too wonky around that. Um, authorization logic and views. Um, so again, this is you know, developer is correctly checking for roles, um, seeing if they're an admin, but they're just showing and hiding that in the view. And so on the back end, uh, you want to ensure that in the actual controller logic uh, that corresponds to this view, you want to make sure that they're properly checking roles there as well. Um, the, the use of skipping of filters. Um, so again, uh, this is just more Try to vet it if you see it, uh, because you want to make sure that the developer actually meant to do this. Uh, so sometimes we might see things like uh, developers trying to test with like a curl client. They don't want to play around with uh, authenticity tokens, so they'll say skip before action, verify authenticity token, um, and then forget to take that back out when they commit it. And so then you have CSERF across that controller. Um, Rails scaffolding um, is really nice in the sense that it allows you to get uh, controller actions up and running very quickly, and it'll generate things like views and controllers for you. Um, the problem is that it generates some artifacts that uh, developers don't really know about. Um, and so here, we're just running uh, Rails generate scaffold, and then you kind of specify um, the attributes for that model. And again, it'll go through generate the views, uh, these JBuilder files, um, and then the active record models. So what happens with that um, is that, for example, for the JBuilder files, um, this is kind of a, a view template so that when you request a JSON response, um, it'll, it'll generate this and then add all of these attributes automatically. So every single attribute you generate in Rails Scaffold 
will be available by default. Um, so if you have some secret token or something that you don't want users to see, it's going to show up automatically. Um, in the same way uh, for strong parameters, which is kind of the, the protection for mass assignment vulnerabilities in Rails, um, all of the attributes will automatically get added to the permit method. So every single attribute is going to be mass assignable. Um, so yeah, those are going to be some of the patterns. Um, we're going to talk about Boilerman right now. So we only looked at one controller, the post controller. Um, if you can imagine checking every single before action for every controller in an application, it can become a pretty big hassle here. Um, so Boilerman tries to bring every single before action across every controller into one place that you can query and look at um, dynamically. Um, so just a bit about how it works. Um, it plugs into existing Rails applications um, and it gets mounted as a Rails engine. So you do need pretty much shell access to the application. Um, with Rails assessments and it being more towards the startup kind of crowd, our clients tend to be pretty open uh, with giving us full sh shell access to their box or they just quickly stand up like a staging instance. Um, so yeah, again, as a minimum requirement, rail, um, access to the Rails console is going to be needed. But yeah, once you have it mounted, you can just go to forward slash Boilerman um, in the application and then start running through it. So I'm actually going to go through a quick demo here about what this looks like. <laughs> nice. All right, so the example I'm going to use here is Rails Goat. Um, so Rails Goat is an intentionally vulnerable Rails application, um, kind of released through the OWASP organization. Uh, so this is a full application if you guys want are interested in ever testing Rails apps or getting started doing security assessments. Uh, you can get this up and running really quickly um, and then start going through some common Rails vulnerabilities. But yeah, this is this is a full web app. You can kind of log in um, and play around with that. But if we just go to forward slash Boilerman here, I've already installed it into this application. Um, you're going to start seeing, uh, this is the main view. So you have basic filters uh, to say, you know, show me only the controllers that include a string. Uh, give me every action um, that you know, has a specific before action or without one. Um, so here you're going to see a, a table breakdown of every single controller and every action on that controller. Um, so here we have the controller, here's the forgot password action, and here are all the um, before actions that get run. Um, so I don't know if there are any people out there that assess Rails applications for a living, but could anyone spot a vulnerability right now based off of an action that should probably get run on every single action controller? Uh, well, it, <laughs> so it's not actually here is the thing, because these are all the actions that are getting run. Um, exactly, yeah. So um, by default, if we look into the application controller, uh, we'll see that it's commented out here with some Note about security guys talking about sea surfing. Um, so if we uncomment this out um, and refresh the page here, we'll see verify authenticity token um, is automatically added to every single action. So that's kind of nice to be able to um, spot things like that automatically. Um, but we have an example here. So there's a mobile API endpoint um, available here. So uh, if we look at API, um, we'll see there's a, an, a, an API controller available for users um, and then one available for the mobile controller. So if I kind of open up so rake routes is really nice. Um, rake routes is going to show you every single controller action here. Oh, this is not going to show well is it? Um, this is pretty much something I ask every client straight off the bat, um, and it's going to show you every single path in the application so you don't have to enumerate them um, manually. But if we look here, this isn't shown too well. I don't know how well this is going to come up. Um, but we have this kind of uh, 
So if we say API v1 users, so this is going to go to the users action or the users controller with the index action. So if we pull that up here, um, we'll see things like valid API token. So I'm, I'm pretty certain that that's going to be um, some kind of auth authentication type action. Let's see, I'll go right here. So here we're getting HTTP token access denied. Um, so that's probably going to be from this valid API token. If we look up the actual user's controller, we'll see that they're saying before filter valid API token. Um, and so if we look at that method, they're doing some kind of authentication around that. Uh, so I'd want to say, I'd probably want to find any API controller actions that don't call this method. So if I go back up to the filters and say, you know, for the API controllers, give me every single action um, without the valid API token. Um, and we'll see nothing comes up in the user's controller, but every mobile controller um, controller action is going to be seemingly vulnerable and has no authentication. Um, so if we go back to the rake routes and we pull one of these guys, Uh, we get a null response here, but we'll, you see that we're no longer getting the HTTP token um, error back. So if we look at the mobile controller uh, for our index action, which is what we've just called, uh, we'll see first there's no before filter uh, that's expected. And then in the index action, it's, it's requiring this class parameter. And ultimately what's going on here, um, this is a bit of a non-standard code pattern. You're not really going to see this too often, apart from the uh, dynamic uh, classification, I guess. Um, but they're saying, given whatever class you pass in as a parameter, turn that into a class, constantize it, and then just call dot all on it, which is going to return everything um, for the provided class. So we can do something like class equals user, and it'll call user dot all and return everything here. So that's the demo. Um, but if you kind of assess Rails applications for a living and see this, like this should already be something really nice that hopefully is going to be useful. Um, it's a new application, so it's going to be a bit rougher on the edges. Um, but I encourage anyone um, who assesses Rails apps to use it. Ping me um, if you ever see anything wrong with it. Uh, but again, to, to use it, uh, you can do gem install boiler man. Um, but primarily, you're going to add it to the gem file of your Rails application um, and then run bundle install. The takeaways is even if you don't use uh, Breakman, Rails console is extremely powerful um, in assessments. That's kind of where this tool came from. I just started kind of playing around and then realized, like, hey, you can pretty much query programmatically any aspect of a Rails application if you have access to it. Uh, future ideas, uh, adding some D3 visualizations. We're kind of working on it on the way up here. Um, but didn't get it quite done. Source querying uh, is going to be coming soon as well. So in the cases of like Pundit and CanCan, you can say, give me all the controller actions that don't call authorize. Um, but yeah, that's everything. Any questions? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I think I was supposed to do that. I'll show that really quickly here. Uh, so yeah, if you don't have access um, outside of the app, uh, you can run it through Rails console directly. Um, it just says install your gem with the, app, the gems with the application. Well, it runs dynamically like within Rails, so you do need to like have the ability to run that. It's like it's great, that I Breakman is static. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And then point it back to you. Yeah, but yeah. Breakman is static analysis, so that's just parsing the code right. and doing right. it. Whereas this is this is actually like loading it within Rails and then right. walking so the tree. So you, you do need the yeah, app running. It's a little bit different. Yeah, and there, there are going to be some cases where uh, you might have sh shell access to the box, but for one reason or another, you can't um, add it to the gem file and relaunch everything. So you can force sideload it through Rails console. Um, and I have some instructions on the readme on how to do that. But, yeah. Do you want to pull up the Rails console to show that? Yeah, so, I mean, this is the Rails console. If you don't want to yeah. use the actual... Okay. Okay. Sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, you got an hour. Yeah, you keep on going there. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, we had lunch. <laughs> we'll pull up the console.
Yeah, no, I mean, so this is, um, you can just kind of programmatically get this here, but. You're not mirrored. 